um, I needed that as well as anybody else. And uh, uh, church, let's encourage them and let's encourage one another as we continue to walk this walk of faith because while God is good, it's not easy. Hello, somebody. Amen. God is good, but it's not easy. Amen. And we need each other and we need to build up one another in the perfect faith. I'm, I'm just excited what God's doing. God is fulfilling some things I have been praying for. And, um, I'm, I'm looking forward to sharing with you what the Lord has laid on my heart. If you've got your Bible, go to Genesis 41. And uh, I have been recapping the weeks that we've been going through. You know, we're in our series, Destiny's Calling. And that's what the ladder's here for. And uh, we, this is the fifth week. And there's a lot of information in a recap that I, just, I don't want to take time this morning to recap. If you have not been here the past four weeks, I encourage you to go back and watch the videos. But as we've been going through this sermon series, this sermon series is about finding God's purpose for your life. It's about reconnecting and rediscovering why God puts you here on this earth. And we talked about how pursuing our destiny and walking in the call of God is a lot like climbing a ladder. There are rules and there are regulations to climbing the ladder. The same is true for fulfilling and walking in the destiny that God has given you. We've gone through all that. We've gone through uh, how we need to respond. We've gone through the attitude we need to have. And last week we talked about how God has a destiny for you, but God's destiny for you will only be fulfilled in God's time. God has a timetable, and it does not equate your timetable. Your destiny is not about you. Well, that's kind of odd, Brother Drake. It's my destiny. No, it's God's destiny for your life. Okay? It's not about you. We're going to talk about that some more today. And when God is ready to fulfill and ready to bring you into that destiny, it will happen. But before you get there, there's a process you have to go through. There's a waiting time that you have to endure before you receive what God has purposed for your life. And last week, we talked about four things, and I will recap these because they are important to our service today, that waiting will humble us. Waiting, a time of waiting will help us realize our own limitations and weaknesses. It will help us realize and take us off of our own high horse to realize we don't know what's best for our life. It, 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 it humbles us and helps us to rediscover who's really in charge. The second thing is waiting strengthens us. They who wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall run and not grow weary. They shall walk and not faint. When we wait on God, while it may seem taxing, God will strengthen us and bring us to where we can rise above the trials. He won't bring us out of them all the time, but he will help us rise above and become victorious over the trials we endure. The third thing is waiting frees us. It frees us from the responsibility to make everything work. It frees us and lets us realize if it's God's will, it's God's will. It's not my responsibility to align everything and get it into purpose. If he calls me to do it, he'll work it all out. I'm just called to trust and obey. But it also frees us from attitudes. It frees us from sins. It frees us from things in our nature that we would otherwise ignore or were unaware of because waiting has a spotlight effect on it. it will, when, when you're under pressure, you discover who you really are because you discover things in you that you would not have otherwise realized if you were in a season of blessing. The fifth thing is waiting, a fourth thing is waiting prepares us. You have to be prepared to go where God is taking you. God is not going to take you somewhere where your integrity cannot keep you. It prepares you. It develops you into the man or woman you're called to be. And the fifth thing is waiting blesses us. It's on our, uh, it's on our sign out front. They who wait on the Lord shall not be shamed. Your waiting is not wasted. God will reward those who wait. Even in times of difficulty, God will bless those who trust and wait on his time. This week, we're going to continue sort of in that vein of timing and going to look at how we need to respond and how some things that need to happen as we approach the destiny God has for us. I want to ask you a question, and I am be honest. How many of you in here have a bucket list? Okay, bucket list. I, I, I have one. Okay, this, this term, it's been around for a little while, but this term uh, became popular back in 2007 with the, uh, with the film The Bucket List with Jack Nicholson and Morgan Freeman. If you've never seen it, it's a really good movie. It's sad, but it's good. 
And the whole gist of the movie is there's these two men in their elderly years, and they're both diagnosed with terminal cancer. And so they sit down and they start discussing and collaborating ideas, and they make a list of things they want to do before they hit the bus. And their whole, their whole motivation was they did not want their life to end in regret. There were so many things that they wanted to see and wanted to do that they got so caught up in life that they forgot about it, that now that they're closer to death, they wanted to do it. So they would not end their life saying they didn't get to complete something. And from that, they developed this, this, this fad, I guess you will, this mindset to create a bucket list. And uh, again, the whole idea of it is to make a list of things you want to do before you die and mark them off as you do it. And people do these things, and, and what's funny about a bucket list is I have yet to talk to somebody who their bucket list materials are extravagant or elaborate. Some of them are a little out there, but most of them are pretty simple. Uh, some people have said they just want to go see a, um, see a New York Yankees game. They've never gotten to go see the New York Yankees. Some people will say that they want to just go and uh, they, they, want to, they want to see one of the seven wonders of the world. Or uh, they, want to, um, they want to drive a race car. Or they, they, they want to go and they want to experience these things. It's funny that when you look at a bucket list, the majority of people, their mindset is not on accomplishments. It's not so much about becoming a millionaire or becoming a president of a corporation or becoming somebody. The majority of the time when you look at somebody's bucket list, it's all about the experiences rather than the accomplishments. Because even though we live in a materialistic society, we realize that money, fame, and power are fleeting. We realize we cannot take those things with us. Now, while when we die, you know, our, our brain, everything shuts down, those memories we have created and those memories we have experienced do not die out there at all. Am I making my point here? What's the point of the bucket list, Brother Drake? Well, the whole point of the bucket list is to make sure that you don't end your life with regret. But he's, there's a problem. While a bucket list can be a good thing, it can also be a hindrance because a lot of people become obsessive. Any obsessive people in here? I was going to say, y'all better raise your hand. I know you're in here. <laughs> if you're like me, when you do something, you become so obsessed with it that until it's accomplished, you cannot rest. And while it's good to be motivated, it is a hindrance to have a list of things that you have not accomplished or have not attained because if you continue to look at this list, and realize you've not even made a dent into it, depending on what you have, then you'll take on a negative mentality. You'll start thinking, well, I've only completed two, I've got 12 more to go, and if you're not careful, then you'll look at your life and you'll compare it to what's on your list or compare it to what everybody else is doing, and you'll see your life as less than and unimportant. See, I, we live in a dangerous society, not just with all the evil going on, but those cell phones are one of the greatest tools of the enemy. Because not only can you access all sorts of wickedness, but you can get on Facebook and scroll and just something as simple as looking at somebody's vacation pictures or looking at somebody getting a job or looking at somebody doing something can cause you to feel like your life is a waste. Because you think, I haven't done what they have, so therefore I must be less important. We, we, that, that's our society. Our, even my, people in my generation, we feel like we have to keep up. And if we can't keep up, then we might as well just give up. That's the society we live in. A bucket list can be a joy, but it can also be something that steals, kills, and destroys your joy and contentment in life. Because if all you focus on is attaining something or experiencing something, while it may not be evil in and of itself, you're losing your focus. you got to be careful what you focus on. A bucket list can also become self-centered. And you can become so enamored with completing what you want to complete that you ignore anybody else's opinion about your life, including God's. Y'all yeah. quiet, just come up. You get so focused on what you want to see, what you want to do, that you don't even ask God's input about it. I told Sister Teresa this morning that this whole series, I don't know if anybody else is getting anything out of this, but I sure am. And I guess it's because five days a week I'm pouring over this and God's dealing with me 
and before he deals with you. But as I started going through this sermon series and looking through things, I started reassessing my own message. And Misty, I started, I started, I was telling Teresa this morning, I have started questioning a lot of things in my own life. Questioning, am I, you know, am I truly walking in God's purpose for my life? Making sure that I'm doing exactly what he's called me to do. Not just in my vocation or my, my ministry here, but in my day-to-day -day life. Am I, am I not fulfilling what he wants me to do? Susan, I've asked the questions, you know, are the things that I want to attain, are they really pleasing to God? Are they really what he wants for my life? Because let me tell you this, I want to make this point. Just because it's important to you does not mean it's important to God. Just because you see it as something that has to happen does not mean from the eternal perspective of God that it is important according to your destiny. He may not give you that job that you so want because he realizes it's not a good situation for you to go into. He may not give you that person you've been praying to get married to because he realizes they're not the one that he's destined for you to marry. He's not going to let you go through these things because he sees it from a broader perspective than what you see it from. Just because you think you've got to do it doesn't mean that God agrees. Tell us somebody. And so I started thinking about this, and I started reassessing my own bucket list and thinking, you know, these aren't necessarily evil, they're not necessarily bad, but, you know, I can't focus so much on things because things have never and will never be my destiny. Accomplishments and attaining things are not necessarily what God has called me to do. Because I've already said it, it's not about me becoming somebody, it's about his will being fulfilled. If that means Drake is preaching at a one shot, a one door shotgun church in the middle of nowhere, then that's where Drake's going to be. Amen. If that means, which, Lord, if so, prepare me. If that means Drake and Taylor go with the help of the less fortunate in Uganda, then let Drake be there. But Drake's going to have to accumulate to Africa before that happens. Okay? Now, I know you're bad. I mean, you're more spiritual than I am. But anyway, am I making my point? My point is, while you can have goals and you can have things you want to do, you cannot get so fixated on that 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 becomes your destiny. Because I said it last week, if not the week before, you can aspire to your own goals and your own destiny and you'll get to the top only to find you're still unfulfilled. Because you did not go where God wanted you to go. Only through his will will you find joy, peace, and contentment in your life. So I started reassessing my own bucket list, and I, and this may sound cliche, but it's true, and I can honestly say my bucket list is three things. Whatever God says, wherever God says, whenever God says. Amen. Whatever he wants for my life, whenever he says it's time, however he wants to do it. That's it. Because I'm going to fail if I do it my own way. I want it to be whatever he says, wherever he says, whenever. Because if we're not careful, we'll get so caught up in living that we'll forget to prepare for eternity. The biggest regret you'll have is living this life and not preparing for eternity. Yeah. Because that's forever. You can have all the riches you want to in this life, and you can be somebody. But can I tell you, there are billionaires who today are in hell who have wished they had done things differently. There are people, there are, there are people who were the most famous in the world who have gone on to their eternal, their, to their eternity, and they themselves are in a pit somewhere saying, I wish I would have gotten right with God. Don't get so caught up in living here that you miss the destiny he has for you, because if you get so caught up in what you want, it would be a shame for you to sit in this church or in a church Sunday by Sunday, Wednesday by Wednesday, and get to the judgment and, him, and hear him say, depart from me, I never knew you. Because only those who do his will belong to him. As 
say all that to say, we have to be mindful of God's direction for our life. We have to be in tune with what he's saying because as long as we are doing our best to follow his will, then we will have what we need. Seek ye first the kingdom of God, and then he'll add all these things into you. Am I making sense this morning? We, that's why it's important that we've got to obey and do what he calls us to do because if we get out of his will, we're going to be frustrated. We're going to be unfulfilled. But when we stay in his will, and we are mindful of what he says and what he wants, then we'll have joy. Then we'll have peace. Then we will begin to elevate to the destiny and the purpose that he has for our lives. Joseph, we've been talking about him for five weeks, and he is one of the perfect examples of this kind of mentality. Because Joseph's life, as we know from the very time we're introduced to him to the very end of his story in Genesis 51, I think it is, Joseph did not have an easy journey. Now, God called Joseph to some great things. You know the dream. I'm not going to rehash those. And his brothers were jealous of him and hated him. And you know that his life was just full of disappointments, setbacks, and questions. And as we progress through this, there's a lot of things he went through that would have made a lot of us give up, if we're being honest. A lot of us would have been done as soon as we got thrown into the pit. As soon as we got lied on by Potiphar's sleazy wife, we would have been done. But not Joseph. Joseph kept on because Joseph was in tune enough with the purpose and will of God that no matter what happened to his life, he kept himself in such a way that even in the midst of setbacks, he was in the divine will of God. And because he stayed patient, because he waited it out, God eventually elevated him to the place he was destined to be. Now, we're going to be in Genesis 41, but i got to give a little backstory. Last time we were seen as Joseph, he was in prison. And he interpreted the baker and the butler's dream. And all he asked was that when you are, when, when you're restored, please remember me. Y'all remember that? But then the butler forgets. Again, Joseph is forgotten. So two more years he's sitting in the dungeon. Two more years, 17,000 something more hours, 729 something days, however many weeks he just keeps waiting. Minute by minute, year by year, moment by moment. And Joseph has nobody around him to encourage him. He has nobody around him who's telling him, man, it's going to be all right. You're going to make it. He has nobody, he has no parents, nobody there saying, son, we're praying for you. God's got a plan. He has himself and the promise that God has given him to hold on to, and that's it. All he's got is what God has said, and that's the only hope he has. But can I go ahead and tell you that's all he needs? That's right. Can I tell you all you need? Oh, I feel God. Yeah. All you need to make it through the waiting time you're in is a word from God. You don't need a paragraph. You don't need a whole sentence. All you need is a word from God, and that's all you've got to have to hold on to and press through the waiting time. All Joseph needed was a word from God. All he needed was a promise because he knew that God was a man of his word, that if God said it, God will complete it. And so all he had was a promise, but he kept
holding on, God will reward you. The whole time he was waiting, not realizing that behind the scenes, God was working with his back. Genesis 41, starting with verse 1, it says, Then it came to pass at the end of two full years that Joseph, I mean, that Pharaoh had a dream. Now stop right there. It's funny how God works. Because we find out later that not, not only did Pharaoh have one dream, he had two that became one. Joseph's entire track to his destiny started with two dreams. And as he was in the prison, two more dreams confirmed that he was in the will of God, the butler and the baker. And now all of a sudden, Pharaoh, an, an idolatrous individual, has two dreams. Joseph didn't realize it. But God was setting him up. Two dreams initiated it, two dreams confirmed it, and two dreams were about to take him where he was destined to be. Don't you discount what God is doing when you cannot see it. At the end of two full years, it came to pass that Pharaoh had a dream. This is lengthy, but let's read it. And behold, he stood by a river. Suddenly there came up out of the river seven cows, fine-looking and fat, and they fed the meadow. Then behold, seven other cows came up after them out of the river, ugly and gaunt, and stood by the other cows on the river bank. And the ugly and gaunt cows ate up the seven fine-looking fat cows, so Pharaoh woke. He slept and dreamed a second time, and suddenly seven heads of grain came up on one stalk, plump and good. Then behold, seven thin heads glided by the east wind, sprang up after them. And seven thin heads devoured the seven plump and full heads. So Pharaoh awoke, and indeed it was a dream. Now it came to pass in the morning that his spirit was troubled, and he sent and called for all the magicians of Egypt and all its wise men. Pharaoh told them his dream. But there was no one who could interpret it for Pharaoh. Then the chief butler spoke to Pharaoh, saying, I remember. Hmm. i got to stop right there and say, you may have felt forgotten. You may have felt overlooked. But there is a God who remembers. Oh, yeah. You may have felt that you have been overlooked by everybody, but can I tell you, there is a God who is working behind the scenes, who is working those things even when you cannot see it, even when you cannot feel it. He's working, and he is going to bring some things to remembrance, and he's going to set you on your path yeah. in due time. Yeah. I remember my thoughts this day. When Pharaoh was angry with his servants and put me in custody in the house of the captain of the guard, both me and the chief baker, we each had a dream, he and I, each of us dreamed according to the interpretation. Now there was a young Hebrew man with him, a servant of the captain of the guard, and we told him and he interpreted our dream for us. To each man he interpreted according to his own dream. And it came to pass just as he interpreted it, so it happened. He restored me to my office and he hanged him, and here we are. Then Pharaoh sent and called Joseph and they brought him quickly out of the dungeon, and he shaved and changed his clothes and came to Pharaoh. A normal day for Joseph. Brother Gene, I think that morning Joseph woke up, and it was just another day in the prison. He had his schedule. He knew what he was going to go do. As far as he knew, nothing could change. But Sister Tina, what he did not know, is that moment by moment, step by step, these two full years he'd been waiting. Notice it said two full years. Not any earlier, not any later. Two full years. I believe it was to the day. He woke up. And life, he thought, was just going to be the same. But then all of a sudden, here comes an official from the palace. And he says, you have been requested. And then life changes immediately. Life that morning was going to be the same in Joseph's mind, but what he did not realize, oh, I wish y'all get in this with me. What he did not realize is God had been aligning everything. God had been setting him up, and that at the right time, he was going to intervene, and in a moment's time, Joseph was coming out of the prison and into the palace. Hear me today. You may not see it, you may not feel it, and you may not even hardly believe it, but there is a God who is working behind the scenes, who is setting everything up, who is getting everything in order, and at the appointed time, and when he is ready, and all is set in order, he is going to bring you and fulfill what he Promise. He didn't realize it, but God was setting 
to totally shift. And he said they brought him quickly. Everybody say quickly. quickly. They brought him quickly out of the dungeon. Let me tell you, God's timing may seem like it takes forever. It may seem like he's late, but he's always on time. And when he gets his time ready, he will work quickly. That's why you always got to be ready. So they brought him quickly out. And we can shout there. And I wish I could stop there, but there's something else. They brought him out quickly. But notice what happened. They brought him quickly out of the dungeon and it says he shaved and he changed his clothes. What's the significance for this, right? He had to get cleaned up before he went before the king. Before he could go stand before the head honcho, there were some things he had to get cleaned, cleaned off. He had to remove the prison garment. He had to wash his hair and get the stink of the dungeon off of him before he went before the highest official. Because if he went before him with an unshaved face and dirty clothes, it would have been an abomination to Pharaoh and he could have been thrown out and never had the opportunity to interpret the dream. What are you saying? As we approach our destiny, there's a cleansing process yes, we must go through. Yes, yes. See, one of the problems, this has got to come off. Talking about restricting things. The problem is, and I don't have my, my illustrations, but that's fine. It's easy to climb when I've got my hands free. It's easy to climb when I have nothing attached. But if I start adding tool belts, and I start adding uh, jackets, and I start adding all this extra weight, and I start adding these things hanging off of me that's making my hands not free, it's going to be hard to climb. See, you can't climb while still trying to hang on to certain things. The reason a lot of us are having problems excelling and moving up toward the place God wants us to be is that we're still trying to hang on to the dirt and the filth of the world. I'm going to preach it whether you want me to or not. There's a lot of us in here who we're trying to get closer to God. We're trying to excel up to where he is. But don't you realize that filth and worldliness cannot stand before the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. When we approach the destiny that God has for our life, we've got to get cleaned up. We've got to change those old clothes of worldliness and unrighteousness and put on the garments of the new believer. We've got to shed those habits and those things. See, let me tell you, I spent years trying to get close to God with an addiction to pornography. You may not know my testimony, but for eight years I tried and I couldn't break it. I never could get my mind fixated around it. And finally one day it broke. And can I tell you, the day it broke was the day I went another step higher. You cannot draw closer to the heavenly reward of what he wants you for if you're hanging on to sin, habits, and the past. See, we will shout and get all excited when we talk about ridding ourselves of sin, but when it comes to letting go of the past, we get all offended. But can I tell you, the past is one of the greatest hindrances to our progression. Yes. Holding on to things that an ex-spouse did to us. Or holding on to things that so-and-so said and did. Oh, we, we know we gotta, we got to get our hearts pure, but when it comes to letting go of things in the past, you just don't understand. You don't know what that means. You don't know what I went through. You don't know the struggle. Sister, brother, I know. I may not know. But what I can tell you is you will not get any further hanging on to it. I'm not trying to belittle it, but this is going to set somebody free. It's time to let it go. It's time to let it go. It's time to build you a bridge, get over it, and then burn the bridge. It's time to quit dwelling on all the pain, quit dwelling on the hurt, Quit dwelling on what they said. Quit dwelling on what they did. Because the thing is, you're holding nobody captive but yourself. You're not hurting anybody but yourself. And you are your own worst enemy if you keep hanging on to what happened 20, 30, 50 years ago. It's time to become a mature believer in Jesus Christ and 
and make up your mind, I'm not going to be stopped. I'm not going to be hindered. I'm going to step over this, and I'm going higher in Jesus Christ. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Joseph could not move up to the step God had for him until he got cleaned up first. He had to transform his whole appearance. If you read, you'll read right, right over it. If you don't know the symbolism, you'll miss it. But to shave, in the, in the Egyptian culture, a beard was a sign of mourning. Egyptians were always clean shaven. Those little beards you see them with in the pictures, those were fake. It was just a symbol of, of whatever they had. But, but scrub anything was an abomination because that meant you were in mourning. You had a, you had a mental state of depression is what it meant in the Egyptian culture. And clothing all throughout the Bible represents your identity. Joseph was identified as a prisoner because of his appearance. But notice that his entire appearance changed when he stood before Pharaoh. To, in order to stand before God and reach our destiny, we've got to be transformed. Mind, soul, and body. We've got to let go of some mentality. We've got to let go of some attitudes. We've got to let go of some things and allow ourselves to be transformed. Joseph was moving on from the prison. He was no longer a prisoner. That step was over, but he had to get cleaned up first. There's some of you here today, you've got to go through a cleansing, and until you do, you're not moving. You've got to let go of some sins, let go of some habits, let go of some attitudes, let go of the past. Hebrews 12 and 2, laying aside the weight and the sin that so easily besets us. You cannot run this race while having, while having chains on your ankles. You can't do it. To approach the destiny, you've got to be cleaned up first. So Joseph was brought out quickly, but not he did not reach the place until he got cleaned up. You'll reach the place when you allow those things to be washed away. So he approaches Pharaoh, and I'm going to try to hurry here. And he, as he comes before Pharaoh, Pharaoh looks at him and he says, I have a dream. Nobody else can interpret it. But then he says, I've heard it said of you. Let me stop right there. What could people say of you today? Yeah, yeah. Joseph was a prisoner. A prisoner. Pharaoh, what I love about this, Pharaoh, the highest authority in the land, when it comes, he was so desperate to get this dream interpreted, he looked past all of the other officials and went to the lowest person in his kingdom, a prisoner. I wrote this in my notes, and I have to say this. Pharaoh overlooked those who were overlooking Joseph. The most overlooked man became finally became the most sought after man in the kingdom. The lowest man on the totem pole became the most important person to Pharaoh because he had a gift. Because even in the prison, Alan, he had a reputation. Pharaoh said, I've heard it said of you. What could people say of us? What reputation are we representing? Another sermon for another day. I've heard it said of you, you can interpret dreams. And Joseph looks at him and he says, it is not I, but God. Again, Joseph had an opportunity to make a point. He could have said, yeah, it was me. I interpreted that dream and it was right. Go ahead and give me the best shot, Pharaoh. But instead, it's not me, but it's God. As we approach our destiny, we must never, 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 ever, 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 never, never try to stand on top. As we approach the purpose God has for our life, we must never attempt to stand on the very top step. 
You look at this ladder and any other ladder, it don't matter if it's this eight foot one, a 16 foot one, or a four, four foot one, every one of them will say about the top, actually the top two, but the top one especially, this is not a step. Do not stand. It says, if you don't believe me after service, come up here and look. It will tell you at that very top black part, this is not a step. Ladder safety rules will tell you that you have gone too high if you no longer have anything to hold on to, or get this, your knees have no place to rest. That's a revelation in itself. You know you've gone too high when your knees have no place to rest. I'm going to make this point right here because I have to. If you're wondering if you become prideful in your life, are you too good to kneel before God? Okay, you didn't, you didn't say that. Okay, I'll move on. That's fine. Somebody got it. The top was not meant for you to stand on. See, you can try, but I'll guarantee you, if you stand on the very top of this ladder, you're going to fall. It's inevitable. Because if it's not a step, they meant it's not a step. It's not meant for you to be there. If you stand up there, you're going to tilt one way or the other, and you're going to fall because the ladder itself is going to lose its balance. See, it's kind of crazy that they even make ladders with that sort of design because you're thinking, why even put it there if I can't stand on it? The whole point of the thing is, first of all, to hold some tools so you're not holding your baggage. Hello, somebody. But the second thing is, it's what keeps the ladder in balance. It's what keeps, if, if that part wasn't there, there would be no ladder. That's what keeps the, the, that's what keeps the balance of the ladder intact. See, here's the point I'm trying to make. We should never try to take credit for things God has done in our life. Yes. Joseph had the opportunity to be prideful, but even Joseph realized before it was written, pride comes before a fall. This step was not meant for you to attain. It was meant for you to stay under. That step is not for you. That's God's place. That's where God is supposed to be. Because when you try to escalate yourself, you can try. But I promise you, you will fall. You will fall. When you try to take credit for what God has done, and Sister Nina affirmed this in, in a way, God will share his glory with no man. And if you try to take his glory from him, he will remove it too. Can I tell you that's why we have a bunch of churches that are devoid of the anointing? Because they've made it about them. We've got pastors, preachers, prophets, and prophets who their ministry what they do is all about me, 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 me. And we got church people with the same mentality. Church is no longer about what God wants. It's about what we want. And that's why God is not showing up in some churches. Because church is not focused on the right thing. You cannot get to that top and expect to remain. God will not tolerate. Because I've said it once and I'll say it again. Your destiny is not about you. It's not about you accomplishing anything. It's not about you getting a title. It's not about how talented you are. It's not about how, how smart you are. It's not about your pedigree. Your destiny is all about bringing praise and honor and glory to the King of Kings and Lord of Lords. The whole purpose of your destiny and the purpose God has for your life is for when people look at you, you can say like Joseph, it is not me, but it is him. And all praise, all honor, and all credit is given back to him because he did not say if you be lifted up that he would draw all men. He said if I be lifted up, I will draw all men to myself. Can I tell you, if we want to see miracles, if we want to see deliverance, if we want to see signs, we've got to put him back in his place and make sure that we do not take credit for something only God can do. Yes. That step was not meant for you to attain. It was meant for you to stay under. Your destiny is for you to stay under God because as long as you're under him, as long as you're under his authority, yes. then he can anoint you. Yes. 
The anointing does in the Bible, they did not pour from the feet up. They poured from the head down. And as long as your head, as long as you're below him, he can pour the oil of the Holy Spirit upon you and you can be saturated with what he wants to do. We must be careful. When God starts bringing us into the place he has for us, that we never try to take his glory. Without him, I am nothing. But with him, I have many things. Without him, I am an athlete. I have no power in of myself, man. I can't do it. Mr. King, I cannot walk this walk of life without him. I'm nothing but with his anointing. I can't heal a father headache but with his anointing. I couldn't, I, I, I could not even begin to try and, and pray over somebody who's been dead but with his anointing. Without him, I'm nothing. But with him, I have no means. The story progresses, and I'm not going to read it all because I know we're pressed for time. I'm hurrying. Pharaoh gives him a dream. And he, and he starts telling him all that happens. And, and Joseph tells him, he says, all right, here's, here's what they mean. He tells him seven, you know, seven good cows or seven years of plenty. The seven good heads of wheat or seven years of plenty. But the, the blighted wheat and the, the, the dark cow, that's seven years of famine. And he said, the famine, there's going to be seven years of nothing. But there's going to be seven years of nothing. And he said, you've got to prepare those seven years of good in order to survive the seven years of life. Because if you don't, people will forget the good years. One thing I think we've got a problem, we've forgotten the good years. Hello. And as Joseph has given him all this information, Pharaoh is amazed. And you go on and you read in verse 40 and then verse 46, and it says that, that Pharaoh looked at his men and said, there's nobody here that has the Spirit of God like this man. And it says that he promoted Joseph to number two. Number two, from in, in an instant, Joseph went from the prison to the palace. Pharaoh put him, it, can, it says three times, I underlined it, that he put him over all the land of Egypt. He said, you are over everybody except me. There's that head part of you. You have authority. Nobody even moves their leg, one translation says, unless you give them the say so. And Pharaoh took his ring off and put it on his hand, which was a symbol of him transferring authority. In an instant, Pharaoh promoted Joseph from the lowest of low to the number two man in the nation. In a moment's time, Amber, Joseph went from the dungeon to the palace, from a prisoner, Misty, to prime minister. I've said it, I'm going to keep on saying it. God can promote you and bring about your promise and fulfill what he's promised like that. When you keep trusting him, when you keep abiding by his word, when you stay faithful to what he has called you to do, even when you don't understand it, he can take you from being the underdog to the number one pick. I thought about Tyler the entire time I was writing this sermon. Because, Jeff, let me tell you, I know there's things going on and we're all praying and we don't understand it. But there's a plan that we cannot see. Amen. There's a plan. I don't know. And I'm sorry to point Tyler out like that, but I, I felt like I had to say that. I don't know where God's going to take the joiner boy. But what I can tell you is that at the end of his life, however it plays out, God's going to get the glory for it, regardless of how the situation plays. Because when you're faithful and you don't associate with the junk of this world and you don't participate in all the mess of sin, God will promote you and he will bring you to the place of his fulfilled will. Come on.
The promotion to your destiny can happen in a moment's time. He can take you from a nobody to a somebody. It don't matter who's overlooked you, who you felt ignored by. God knows where you're at. He remembers you, and he still has a plan. But here's the part that we don't like. We want the promotion, but here's a fact that I've got to point out before I close. We like to stop there. Joseph went from the prison to the palace. Hallelujah! And that's where the sermon ends. But Joseph would have never been promoted if he hadn't gone to Egypt. Let that sink in. In order for Joseph to become prime minister, he had to first get to Egypt. What are you saying? Everything he went through, he had to go through. Yeah. Yeah. He had to be sold out by his brothers. Yeah. Yeah. He had to be lied on by Potiphar's wife. Yeah. He had to be forgotten by the butler. The pain, the trials, the struggles, the questions, everything had to happen in order to get him to the right place so that at the right time God could bring him to the right person. I'm here to tell you everything that's happened in your life so far it may have been painful it may have been questionable it may have been so miserable but can I tell you God has a purpose for all. Every lie somebody's told on you God had a plan for it. Every trial you've been through God had a plan for it. Every trouble, every struggle, everything that you don't understand, God has used it to bring you to the place so that at the right place, at the right time, He can take you to your destiny. Yes. That's why you are never to forsake the time of small beginnings. Yes. We hate trials. Yes. Don't we? Nobody wants to go through a trial. Yet the Bible continuously says, count it all joy. Because not only does it prepare us, but it brings us to the place where we can be promoted. The trials, the struggles, and the troubles. If it had been up to us in the middle of them, we'd have gotten out of it. And we would have had some temporary joy because we didn't have to go through it. But let me tell you, if we had gotten out of it when we did, we'd have never gotten where we are today. Joseph had to go through everything he went through in order to get him to the place so when Pharaoh had a dream, he was there. And the only reason he got promoted when he did is because God, he had obeyed God, and he didn't give up. He kept going. I don't understand it. I don't see it. I don't necessarily like it. But God, you see it. God, you promised it. The trials and tribulations, you may not understand them. You may not like them. But they're taking you somewhere you can never get without them. If those situations not only prepare Joseph, but they position him. Your trials and your tribulations, they're preparing you, but they're positioning you for the greatest move of God. Can I tell you that as I thought about this, and I'm trying to hurry, but I'm just, as, as it's coming, I'm just saying it. The trials and the tribulations this church has been through over the past 10 years, some I know about, some I don't. While we want to rehash them and we can talk about how miserable it was, can I tell you without them, we'd have never gotten where we are today. And without them, we would have never gotten to where we're going. And I don't know what your vision for this place is, but I've got one, and it's way beyond what you ever could think or imagine. Because God did it, not me. The trials and the tribulations prepared you, but they also positioned you. After 13 years of waiting, you see, I'm going to stay whenever you're ready. I didn't do too bad. I'll get you done before the baggage gets in the way. After 13 years of waiting, 
Joseph's life was changed in an instant. His whole world was turned upside down. And, and Brother Gene, his, his life would never be the same after that. But imagine. Angel, think about being in Joseph's position. What if he had given up the day before? David, think about it. What if 24 hours before, Pharaoh called and Joseph said, that's it, I'm done. I've waited 728 days. I'm tired of waiting. I've been in this filthy prison with these filthy prisoners. Nobody appreciates me. I'm just sick and tired of it. I'm not waiting anymore. I'm done. Imagine. He just gave up. Quit fighting. Quit trying. Told the, the head prison guard, I don't want him anymore. Put me in chains. Put me in chains. And kill me if you want to. I'm done. Sister Eunice, imagine what you would have missed. He would have missed the opportunity to save millions of people's lives. Millions would have died because he decided he was through. Can I tell you, your decisions don't only affect you. You don't know who's, who God's got you planning to witness to. You don't know who God's got you planning to minister to. You don't know, but can I, your decisions will affect that one. He would have missed the opportunity and thousands, millions would have starved. But Miss Gloria, he would have missed out on the opportunity to be reconciled with his family. His father would have lived the rest of his life thinking Joseph's dead. He would have totally missed the plan of God if the day before he said, I'm through. But because he did, because he was persistent, because he stayed faithful, God, and we'll talk about this last next week, God took everything. The psalm said it this morning, God took everything that the world and the enemy meant for evil and turned it for good. Your turnaround can be just a prayer away. So don't you dare give up. Your answer could be one more hallelujah away. So don't you give up. This very day or tomorrow or it may be a year from now, but don't you dare. You will only reach what God has for you if you're persistent. You give up now, you're forfeiting everything God is trying to give you. But you stay faithful. God will take you up the next day. And you'll be one more step closer to the entire destiny that he's designed you. God's timing plus God's plan equals God's destiny for your life. God's timing plus God's plan equals God's destiny for your life. Notice it has nothing to do with you. It's not Drake's plan, Drake's timing equals Drake's destiny. It's not Eddie's plan plus Eddie's timing equals Eddie's destiny. It's what he wants, when he wants. And when you follow those, he'll take you where he wants. Today, I feel all I know because I see it all over some of your faces. Some of you, the entire time I preached, you cried because God's speaking to you. And I'm grateful. Because I knew right in there's a lot of you in here who you felt like you've been in the dungeon a long time. And you're about ready to give up. You're done. But God sent this little 24-year-old preacher today to tell you, don't you dare give up. Don't you dare forfeit what God has brought you to and brought you through. Because the only way your trials and your pain and your troubles are going to be worth anything is if you stay faithful. This morning I want you to bow your 
down here and close your eyes. I'm going to do this real quick so I can get you out of here. But if you, this morning,